Thank you. Hey, my talk is very basic. So I apologize to those that are very advanced and will think this is very basic, but hopefully there's some interesting insights that I'll have even for really advanced people. If you're really new and so like the last talk was way over your head, uh, this is exactly the kind of talk you would want to hear before a talk like that. So hopefully <laughs> you can make things more accessible to you. My name is Andre. I mispronounced my last name, Van Melbrook. I think the Dutch would say Van Moilebroek, and that is my email. All right. I want to start with a quote, uh, an observation actually. When you are designing and all of a sudden it seems like the decisions you make are forced options instead of being arbitrary, that's when you're really getting close to elegance because you're designing based on the constraints of Mother Nature herself instead of just making up arbitrary rules. And so that's why I like Haskell because Haskell, of the things that I know about, are uh, and it's very close to that. Somebody forgot the glass, and I'm going to pick those up later. Okay, so there's some obvious motivations to want to have containers. And I'm not going to get into containers versus context. I'll leave that for somebody else. Uh, I'm just going to call them containers. So we want to communicate the absence of something. This is kind of like having a zero in uh, arithmetic. We want to get rid of null references. We want to express communications that can fail. We don't want to throw errors. That's a big sledgehammer. We want to uh, incorporate the possibility of failure into the type system itself. We want to be able to lift partial functions to total functions. The one that everybody uses is division by zero. So we return a maybe number instead of a number. And also we want to quarantine things that don't fit into the normal function paradigm uh, that are problematic. We just put them in uh, and just quarantine. Uh, and I'll talk more about that here in a second. But we still want to be able to uh, compose those things once we quarantine them. Okay, so we've had our, our containers from the early days, even in Lambda Calculus when they were proving that Lambda Calculus was Turing complete. If you look at some of the stuff they did, there were lists and pairs even at that uh, day and age. But we want to have a, a little better abstraction than that. One foundational axiom here is that composition is the best way to control complexity. Brian Beckman, this guy here, uh, wrote a, uh, did a YouTube on uh, Don't Throw the Moan Out. It's very good. He's not the only one saying that composition is the best way to control complexity, but he says it in a very elegant way. We want to be able to have um, a container that can have uh, zero or more wrapped elements. I'm going to call that the arity. I don't know if I'm the only one that does that, but I like to call it the arity. We want to push the checks for empty containers from the caller into the callee. Uh, otherwise, composition would be difficult. And there's going to be a certain number of members that are going to make sense once we have containers. We're going to have, want to have a wrapping function, or otherwise known as lifting. So you take a native type and wrap it to the container type. We want to be able to take a function and apply it to something that's wrapped, app. And we want to be able to compose and that's bind. Right. Okay, now Bertrand Meyer was very uh, interesting in the early days. He was the one who was very big on telling people, you really need to think very carefully about what is the responsibility of the caller and what's the responsibility of the callee? And he came up with contracts and so forth and so on. I think that was a brilliant observation to make, uh, but unfortunately, I think the Upo kind of missed the boat. This is my way of rising community <laughs> right here. <laughs> the answers that the functional programming community came up with so the questions that Bertrand Myers raised were actually more brilliant than Upo ever come up with it, as far as I can tell. Okay, so, uh, and the most obvious application of his principles is don't check for empty containers in the caller, do it in the callee. If you do it in the caller, no references are a real possibility. Okay, so here's some typical code that you'll see in legacy code where it says if then, and then you keep checking and checking, and then pretty soon you're, you have to scroll away <laughs> just to see what the code is. 
Here's the problem. Let's say there's 9,000 call sites. Do you want to have this garbage? <laughs> <laughs> and what usually happens is people have a manana attitude. They'll say, well, I'm going to do these defensive checks, but I, I'm prototyping. I'll do it manana, and manana never comes. So it never happens. And then, worse yet, sometimes there's a, a subtlety here and there about how you do these checks for the MTD. Maybe there's some little uh, extra flags you have to check or something. So some call sites don't do it the same way. Now we got all these banana peels ready to hit <laughs> the runtime. So the obvious thing is we want to move these into the uh, call A. Another thing that happens sometimes, uh, people notice the container's empty and they return a different type. Or they'll throw an error, and that's the worst thing you can do. That's a very heavy sledgehammer. Or they'll return like an empty string or a minus one or something that isn't even the same type. And then you're not type coherent because the if, uh, the, the then clause and the else clause are the same type, so it's type coherent. You shouldn't be chaining if test, you should be chaining functions. Okay, so I want to channel the scheme community of the 80s and uh, Jerry Sussman and the Wizard Book and so forth. One of the big things they observe is you want first class citizenship. All the entities of the programming language must be able to share equally in all activities sanctioned by the language. Otherwise, that entity is not first class. So, um, we want to have empty containers being first class. Uh, if you think about for a second what was wrong with that if test, the empty containers were not first class entities. And if we can make them first class entities, then we can have a uh, a, pi a piping mechanism here. This is F sharp, by the way. Here's the pipe operator. Uh, there's an ampersand in Haskell that does the same thing. But nobody uses this. This is a cultural thing. F sharp people like to pipe things like this. Option is maybe. So here I return none. I had to annotate the type here because F sharp type inference isn't as good as Haskell type inference. But, but the point is that I, I deliberately return a none here, and the computation chain is not affected. It doesn't blow up, no problems, because empty containers are first class. Right. So that refactoring of moving these if tests from the caller into the callee, that's a very small refactoring to make. And we, we could have done this even in the old procedural days, even before OOP came along. We have ways of abstract data structure where you call an intermediate routine to do the checking, pass it to the container, and it can decide if it should run the function or not. So this is a very small refactoring step, but it makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Okay, so we start running the calculus, a simple function. We wrap the data, that's a functor. Uh, now, here's the Here's the uh, scheme community again. If you can wrap data, you should be able to wrap functions too. Otherwise, functions aren't first class in container world, right? So if you wrap the function, and I put circles around that to indicate wrapping function, that's called a duplicative. Now, I don't like some of the terminology in Haskell. It's a little confusing, me being an old timer. Uh, applicative, I think of applicative order versus normal order, it's strict versus not strict. That has nothing to do with what applicative means in this context. Um, and in terms of wrapping, pure makes no sense to me. That conjures the notion of pure versus impure, and we're in a pure world, so I would have preferred wrap myself. And return, you know, people from conventional languages think of explicit returns, and that probably confuses them. Okay, so here's uh, some examples of a functor. Here's one where we take a function and just apply it. It's a very simple example. Here we're, uh, we're not changing the parent container type, but we're changing the type of the elements inside of it. So you can do that with a functor or fmap, which is kind of nice. And then here's one where we're applying it to a wrapped value. Now, if we try and return an empty container, with our fmap, here's what happens. You get just nothing. That's not what you wanted. So fmap doesn't have the power to return an empty container. Oh, and I've already reached my time limit. So I'm going to have to just jump ahead because I'm running out of time. Here's some examples of applicatives. Um, maybe I'll make my slides available so you can go through this slower. 
um, show different ways of uh, uh, showing that applicable. The nice thing is that you can have multiple values. Uh, we want to return empty containers. Um, foldable is really wild because you can change the shape of the container. You can return an empty container with foldable. Uh, functor, you can't do that. Only on account of bind. Here's mine. Invented uh, monads were invented by Phil Wilder and Simon Payton Jones wrote a paper about how their like siblings were quarantining things. But we can still, once we quarantine, we can comp compose them and then we don't lose composition. That's a really cool thing about monad. I went over this before. So uh, just one observation I want to make, even though I'm getting close to out of time, is that if you think about the maybe monad, the difference between the mapping function and the bind function is a very, very minor difference. Bind can uh, forces you to return the, uh, it forces you to do the wrapping of the result. And since you get to do the wrapping, you can return an empty container, whereas a uh, functor couldn't do that. So in a sense, monads are just functors with a, a liberalized bind policy. Very oh, interesting. And then if there's a, in Hollywood, you have to leave room for a sequel. The sequel for that would be the either monad because sometimes you care about when failures happen and you want to show how they affect uh, cascading uh, failures down the downstream. And that's what you use for that. So that's all I'll say about that. Oops, I had some suggestions. Use the lightest tool for the job. That's all I'm going to say there. And my wrap-up, uh, this is what we went over. And I'll just open it for questions because I'm out of time. Any questions? If there are no I questions. Question, actually. Um, so you referenced a lot of uh, interesting, I think, historical quotes and uh, people in the PE community. Um, for people who want to learn more about like the history of where these things came from, are there any uh, resources you would recommend? Um, not off the top of my head. Unfortunately, I think there's a lack of uh, information on that. And I, th I think it should be filled. I wrote a talk called um, Monarchs on Steroids where I actually do go through the history of that. Maybe I should make that talk more available because I think people that learn this stuff and don't know the history of it don't appreciate it in its fullness and didn't go through that evolutionary process. I was an old timer. I actually went to conferences and watched Haskell grow up from diapers to actually getting a job. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until uh, Haskell actually got uh, monads that they really had something to offer the real world. And so, yeah, I, I'd like to see more books written just about the history. Yes. So just on that topic, there's a really good lecture by Simon Payton Jones where he, the whole lecture is just him describing the development of Haskell. It's like 45 minutes. And it's pretty cool. It's got lots of really good historic photos. Um, it's on YouTube. Is this the one about being lazy with class? Maybe. I can't remember. Okay. Anyone else want to talk to me? Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, like some of these things have been around for some time in you know, the functional programming literature and academia, uh, but they haven't really got into the, the object-oriented community or some of the mainstream community. Uh, why do you think that is? Is that the confusing terminology? Or you know, do you think there are uh, reasons why some of these things haven't become more mainstream or it's taken so long? That's a really good question. I do actually have an answer for that. Uh, in my talk, mine was on steroids. Maybe I should make it widely available. Um, I, and the only reason I have it, by the way, is because some of the illustrations I use, I don't have proper permissions for. And that's a dicey thing when you make it available. But in that talk, I show that the lag time for an invention getting accepted is about 90 years. For example, <laughs> when, uh, when uh, the Boolean algebra was invented in the 1800s uh, versus when uh, um, the guy was doing his thesis and decided, hey, the boolean algebra is just what we need. Ninety years before that happened. So that's just pretty typical. Look how long it took Java to get uh, landed. So.
Yes. Uh, so uh, I was reading a paper uh, advocating for uh, applicatives and arrows uh, as a restriction on monads because monads are too powerful in a lot of cases. Uh, or in some cases, at least, I can't speak to a lot. But um, was there an era before monads where people were using applicatives strongly? And has that fallen by the wayside? Or is that now being discovered because it didn't have its heyday? Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. I think uh, a lot of these things that we now know, it, it, it codified in a very clean way. Um, in a way, um, scheme programmers and list programmers and other types of programmers were doing kind of hacked up versions of these for a long time. For example, monads is a way of um, having an extra context uh, around. There were ways of doing that with closures and so forth. So, um, does anybody else have a comment on that? Yeah, I think the applications actually come like chronologically after monads. I think the more recent paper was before um, it's one of the papers. So I suspect there probably wasn't that era. And I think that maybe because of that, there never has been a chance to consider more using applicatives without monads. Um, and kind of like I was trying to touch on my talk, there are some advantages to giving up the power of monads because taking that freedom away from the person who's kind of using it gives you more freedom with how you potentially then work with those transformations. Trying to look to the future of, of what we can do next in Haskell. Yeah, it seems like that's a, a really compelling idea. Uh, do you have a ticket to do now? <laughs> we do. That's time. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.